Welcome to Shattered Reality, with your hosts Kate Valentine and Farusha. Prepare to have your paradigms shifted and your truths questioned. And now, Shattered Reality. Shattered Reality. Shattered Reality. Well, here we are again. Hey, Kate. Hi. How are you? Oh, I'm doing just fine. And today... Yeah, we got to slate it, right? That's right. Okay. Today August is 8th. 8th. 2017. Who would have thought? Yeah. Well, we're we're glad to still be here mm -hmm. uh, on Shattered Reality Podcast. And today, I'm really excited to welcome to our show one of our listeners. Uh, yeah, which is very... Yeah. And she is an amazing woman. Mm -hmm. She is um, an author from Morris County. She is a Latina young adult book author, and she was the 2016 winner of two awards of the prestigious International Latino Book Awards for Best Sci-Fi Novel and Best New Author. Nice. Her book, Santa Muerte, The Daniela Story, um, is a, two, a 2016 release from Story Merchant Books Press. She tackles diversity in science fiction and fantasy by using folklore in culture and culture. She holds an MA in clinical counseling and is a licensed professional counselor in Morris County. So let's welcome okay. Lucina Stone. Well, th Thank you for being with us, Lucina. It's a very impressive hi, biography. Hi, Perusha. Hi, hi. <laughs> well, thanks. Hi. And this is hi, Perusha. Hi, Kate Valentine. <laughs> hi, Lucina. Yes, How are you? Hi, Kate. It's wonderful to be on your show. Thank you so much. Um, I want to preface this show a little bit by talking about some things that go on in the UFO area as concerned concerned Latino folks, such as yourself. Um, and um, I'm not going to use the term Anglo folks because I hate that description. I'm going to say the first language, first language English speakers. And this is more true of the men in the first language English speaker community who are interested in UFOs. Uh, what I have found is that a lot of these men are moderately to very intelligent. They uh, write books. They talk about UFOs. And I'm not going to mention anybody's name here because I don't want to make any terrible enemies in the UFO field because we deal a lot in the UFO field. Right, Kate? Right. But they seem to dismiss um, the Latino experiences uh, with UFOs because... The Latino experiences, whether they be from Brazil or Argentina or Mexico or Cuba or any of the places south of our border, the, the descriptions tend to be a little bit more emotional, a little bit more colorful than the um, English-speaking male in America. Mm -hmm. And um, we have had on a couple of people... Uh, who comes to mind first is the gentleman from Florida who is with um, the, um, we had him on, oh boy, now I can't remember his name, isn't that beautiful? Um, but he was on our show, and he was, uh, yeah. Ray Hernandez. Oh, Ray, Ray, Ray Hernandez, Hernandez. Right. 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 And he was a wonderful, yeah. um, a wonderful uh, professional individual, a uh, well-respected lawyer, several degrees, a PhD, and his experiences were just a little more extreme than some of these guys. And boy, they can't give that guy an even break sometimes. So um, mm -hmm. I am here to uh, talk with you about Santa Muerte, first of all, yeah. and how you got drawn into writing this book. Can you help us? Well, it's kind of on, on what you're saying, you know, uh, the cultural oppression that happens um, with Latinos in many areas um, is what attracted me to writing the book. Um, you know, I wanted to write a story that my daughters could relate to culturally in the future. 
and I wanted, and I didn't see anything like um, what I had written out there. Um, so, you know, again, a lot of sci-fi writers are men. Um, and so being able to write it uh, was definitely something, you know, that I wanted to do for my daughters and for other um, people who come from, um, you know, parents uh, presenting same-sex parents in a positive way. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, just definitely um, talking about the spirituality that's so culturally ingrained in Mexican folklore um, and just introducing that uh, in, a, in a new way, in a different way, um, was what I was really challenged with. And um, I find, you know, usually, again, a lot of stories about, um, you know, folklore, sci-fi, fantasy are easily dismissed, um, you know, for Latinos. So I really wanted to get it out there. And But you have chosen to, written this, to write this book in English. Uh, uh, do you yeah. have any plans on writing a companion book or a trans- making a translation into Spanish or Portuguese? Well, I would love to have it translated. I speak Spanish, but I don't write in Spanish. I see. So that's something that, yeah, as a first generation, um, you know, that's something that always happens a lot. Um, culturally is that, you know, that you maintain the language, but sometimes without uh, further training or, or understanding, it's, um, it's, it's hard. And Spanish is a hard language to write in for me. So um, I would definitely need some help to get it translated. Um, it's something that I'm continuing to write a, a book two and a book three on. And, um, you know, you had some other guests who, uh, CM Mayo and uh, Dr. Chestnut, who talked about Santa Muerte, and um, that was definitely, for me, a great um, inspiration to oh, also write the book. Great, great. Uh, we're glad we were inspirational. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. And certainly it's a concept that is very uh, foreign to our culture, really. To the North American. Yeah, North American. Kind of well, culture. it is and it isn't. I mean, it's such a mishmash of cultures here in the New York area that... Yeah, you'd have to call it a mishmash rather than a culture. Oh I yes, mean, it's yes. really the. Yeah, it it depends where you're living. <laughs> yeah, well, we are all familiar yeah. who live in the urban New York area with botanicas, with a lot of um, uh, magic supplies to cast spells and so forth, and figurines of people like um, Doctor Fritz, uh, who Ooh. was. Uh, uh, Doctor Do- Fritz. Who's yeah, Doctor Fritz. He was the guy who, um, the uh, the fellow in Brazil, I guess, was Brazil or Venezuela. Mm-hmm. Ari Arigo. This know. this fellow Arigo. Uh, he channeled Doctor Fritz, who was purportedly a German physician, mm-hmm. and he performed all kinds of operations with uh, just a, like basically a kitchen knife. On Ooh. people, and they yeah. they all did well with it. Though he he uh, kind of like a, a, a maybe um, a, like oh Juan de Dios is today oh, okay. uh, John yeah. of God. Oh, okay. And uh, so yeah, it's very very interesting. And one of our other guests, I believe, currently um, uh, Dr. John B. Alexander, um, he is writing a book now about his experiences with shamanism in South America. So we're hoping to have okay. him back on at some point. But let's get back to you, uh, Lucina. Yeah. Well, and well, uh, yes, what I love so much about Santa Muerte is that she's the sole female saint of death. And um, in writing my story, I thought about how um, how interesting it would be to have such a powerful lady, um, you know, not be known to her own children. So she has a daughter who immigrates to the United States and has her own daughter. And then when they run into trouble, you know, they come back home. And this is where they learn about their background and who she really is. And, um, you know, which often happens, you know, I I also really like stories about immigration and sometimes what's lost um, culturally uh, between the generations. So, which is why I also wanted to write about um, this book about the intergenerational um, attachments and, and the importance of it to maintain it. Yeah, a lot of times people um, uh, lose track of their families uh, when the people uh, immigrate 
into our country or emigrate from their country. I always get those two words a little bit confused. Yes. But I think it might be a little easier to keep in touch with people in Mexico than it is to keep in touch with somebody, uh, like, say, from 100 years ago that left Turkey, for instance, and came here. Right. Right, right. Um, but you always lose a little something, you know, and, and, and living in the American culture is very different from um, the Mexican culture. And even if you go back, you know, you're always kind of missing a little piece of it. And so I, I really liked um, that aspect of the story as well um, to, can you, to highlight that. Can you mm-hmm. tell us if um, you have had any personal experience with the cult of Santa Muerte? I have not personally. Um, you know, I came to learn about Santa Muerte um, through the podcast and through um, Dr. Andrew Chestnut and through researching, um, you know, pagan saints. And, um, you know, when I learned about her and, and all that she represents for people who um, feel like they don't have another, that they can't pray at the Catholic Church or this is their only way to receive um, some kind of connection to their spirituality, um, I really thought it was fascinating, and, and that really inspired me. It is the last refuge of, of the very poor individuals or um, even uh, d- drug runners and so forth in, in Mexico, I understand. So, so and, and it started mostly within the LGBTQ community, you know, feeling outcast by the Catholic Church and feeling like they didn't have a place. So this is a very recent book for you, then. Yes, Yes. Wow. wow. Yeah. That's very impressive. Yeah. Because that's not exactly. Sm- How long did it take you? Is this one of those books that you started and then it just kept flowing? Yes. Yes. It's yeah. something that that I started that that would wake me up at night that I'd see scenes mm-hmm. of in my mind and it just kind of flowed. So I I got it out there and and um you know the the main complaint of the um, people who've read the book is that it's too short. So you know working on book. <laughs> Um, to, to clarify, because it's a big world and it's a big, um, it's a lot to kind of put together um, and it's fast paced. So the readers, um, you know, in this genre are, are very, very smart. Um, so it's to kind of keep keep up with them as well. Well, it's great that you have a, a fan base there and that you're planning on books two and three. Um, will they also be concerned with um, the uh, the patron saint of of death and the uh the bride girl the bony bride girl there yes yes well one of the main characters anaya um she is uh you know her she's known in her her, the town and and where she lives as santa muerte so she represents santa muerte you know again she's uh has a lot of uh people that are devoted to her um but you know she's underground and she's kind of somebody who isn't out there you know um publicizing her abilities and and that she is a witch so um that is going to continue there'll be more witches grave robbings and women in charge and folklore and um you know exploring with race and gender um in books two and three so so you've developed your own little world uh, of lucina stone it's excellent thank you thank you yes it's it's a fun world it's a complex world it's a fast-paced world and um, it borders between, you know, young adult books and also, um, like, new adults. So it's uh, a little bit for, for a wide range of well, well, that's really good because when, you know, when you speak about the English-speaking culture and so on, that's sort of almost passe at this point. And I would say it's starting to die out and pass on. And so I think your books would be a lot more relevant to people of, uh, of I don't know how old you are, but of a younger age. Yeah, I, I hope that the younger audiences can, can definitely relate to it mm-hmm. um, more and also learn, you know, a lot about, um, you know, the 1920s through the 1950s where, you know, it wasn't such a, um, those are bleak times for people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Worldwide. Learn more about that. Yeah, and to learn more about spiritualism and um, folklore. Um, and one of my characters is actually uh, named Sabine, named after Maria Sabina, who is a... Um, you know, back in the uh, 60s, 70s, was, um, I guess, considered a curandera um, Uh using uh, mushrooms, yeah. So definitely trying to interweave a lot of that into the story as well. Have you read much of Carlos Castaneda 
or uh, any of his acolytes? I'm sorry, you broke up. What was that? Uh, I said, have you read much of uh, the author Carlos Castaneda or any of his acolytes? No, no I have not. That's uh, on my good reads to read book. Well, those, I think his books and the books of the women who followed him um, would be of extreme interest to you. Um, he was a, a man from Mexico, uh, spent a lot of time in the U.S., uh, but uh, he visited with um, a shaman of the Yaqui culture, Yaqui Indian shaman called Don Juan. And it's unknown to people, they argue about it to this day, whether Don Juan was a real person or not. I tend to believe he was, but he had uh, uh, gathered around himself a sort of um, a group of women uh, who also wrote books. And um, actually, I liked one of the women's books better than his. And this woman was like um, Linda Ronstadt. Uh, well, she was, uh, she was half German and half South American. Linda Ronstadt, of course, is half German and half Mexican. But uh, like, like Linda Ronstadt, she wrote from that point of view that was both North American and South American. I'm just using those, those words as a shorthand yeah. here. I think that you would find that absolutely fascinating, um, uh, Lucina. Um, yeah. Um, so um, coming up here, um, in terms of Santa Muerte, have you received any messages from people who have written the book who might be adherents to the cult of Santa Muerte? I have not. I have not um, connected with anyone that way, no. Um, you know, again, it's an indie published book, so it, I think it's going to take time to continue to grow an audience. And um, hopefully uh, through this podcast and through, through different venues, I can, um, you know, start to connect more. Well, I certainly hope that you do, but I, I do also hope that you don't run afoul of any of those um, adherents to the cult. So um, what do you have to say about that, Kate? Um, well, no, I think she'll do just fine. She's, um, she's got truth on her side. She'll That's do right. great. That's right. <laughs> so what do, we have, what do we have to look forward to in uh, book two? Have you given it a name? Um, I haven't uh, given it a name yet, but it, it is still a time travel story, and um, it is still about the um, intergenerational connections and um, generational conflicts. Uh, those will continue. Um, witches and magic will continue. Um, you know, the uh, back and forth between race, gender, sci-fi, all of that uh, fun stuff that um, you know people who read in this genre really do enjoy. And um, just taking more time. Um, to just build the world a little bit clearly, continue to make it more clear for the reader um, so that they can immerse themselves even further and um, have some fun, have some fun with more diverse characters um, and, you know, just how fun it is to use diverse characters yes. um, in time travel. It fundamentally changes the trajectory of a story, um, and that is um, tremendously rewarding. I'll, I imagine so, and you also bring in um, a number of LGBT uh, characters, and um, yeah, and I like the way you bring it into uh, a future time, which is not too far ahead of us in uh, Santa Muerte, mm -hmm. where um, these characters are very well revered. Um, uh, they're very well-revered uh, people in the community, um, as opposed to in the past when um, they were stigmatized. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, H had you yeah it, it's a lot of fun. It, it's so much fun to write and um, to be able to, put, you know, challenge, um, again, cultural oppression that, that occurs and, and just expand it and have, you know, just, continue to explore. It's been a lot, a lot of fun. It's a lot of research. It's a lot of work, but um, it's so rewarding. Had you taken actual uh, courses in this, or did you just come by uh, writing so well naturally? I, um, you know, I've always loved to write, um, but this story just 
you know, continued to bother me and bother me. And, and mm-hmm. I just had to like, you know, write it all out. And oh. once I did, um, you know, started to shape it and form it and then um, worked with an editor and helped me to really um, craft and develop the story better and get it out there. So, you know, it is my first book and it is my, you know, first attempt at writing. And um, I continue to write now, you know, different short pieces and book two and um, working on another book as well. So I don't know, these stories just, uh, from someone who's always been listening to other people's stories. Uh, well, you've been taking it in, Lucina. You've been taking it in and storing it. Now, I, I, there, I think uh, we're talking yeah. to a true artist here. Yes, I, do. I creative, agree. A creative person. I agree. Now, can I ask you something really way off in left field? Um, did any yeah, of this yeah. story come to you in terms of a dream? Yes, yes. A lot of it came to me in, in um, dreams. And I don't know, I, I can't even describe it, you know, um, just doing mundane tasks and, and just having like visions of, you know, seeing the scenes in my head play out. And then, you know, sitting down and writing for, you know, hours at a time and then reading it all back and kind of being like, oh, OK, well, that's, that's the story. So, um, so yeah, some of it just was, um, I don't know, it downloaded that way, I guess, hmm. is how I can explain it. A, a lot of people in science feel the same way too. Uh, they just get these epiphanies. Yes, they do get epiphanies through dreams and through meditation. And there are people <laughs> who believe or conject that there are certain um, otherworldly influences on. Uh, artists and scientists, artists, I'm including writers. I mean, people Mm -hmm. like um, Charles Darwin, was it? Am I thinking right? Uh, Yeah, sure. And then there was the uh, DNA guys, uh, Watson and Crick. Watson and Crick uh, dreamt about it. (laughs) And Newton, of course, with the apple Mm -hmm. hitting him on the head. Everybody else would have thought, well, the apple hit me on the head. And he thought, well, why didn't it go up, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, no, seriously, things... Things come in dreams. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it is interesting that the way, um, the way dreams can manifest in our lives, and if we listen to, um, if we, if we listen to, um, to our dreams and we remember our dreams, they can be very instructive to us. And um, as to where this inspiration yeah. comes from, is it from our subconscious? Or is it from um, a, a higher consciousness? I'm not saying God per se as a, you know, a man up in the sky with a white beard, but more like a, a higher being, uh, an oversoul kind of um, uh, character that uh, might be giving us inspiration. Yes, yes. I, I definitely believe that. You know, when I came up with my author name, um, you know, I, I the first name Lucina was always firm. It was, it's after my grandmother. Um, and then in a dream, I had a dream about um, my other grandmother on my father's side, who I had never met or, you know, but I recognized her in the dream. And, um, you know, she came to the dream and was kind of just looking at me and, and other members of my family were in the dream from my father's side. And um, I, it just hit me. I said, oh, yes, stone. Her name was uh, Petra, which translates to stone. Petra, so sure. that's where I got Mm-hmm. So it was, um, you know, so yeah, things, things come in dreams sometimes and, and it's important to listen to them and to, um, you know, it's, uh, I think, a diff- another level of consciousness. Well, it, absolutely. And also, um, I, I, when you said Petra, it reminded me that um, whatever name you give uh, your child uh, or children, uh, you should give some thought to the name that you give your your children, because um, I think that sometimes something manifests out of that. I ran across mm-hmm. um, a statue of a woman in Iceland whose name was Petra, and she was famous throughout Iceland for being able to go walking in the mountains in the north of Iceland and just finding a semi-precious stones and rocks that formed naturally. And the reason why she did this 
is because her name was Petra, and she always related to stones. So this fits oh. right in with your story. If you look, if anybody yeah. wants or is interested to look on the internet and look up Iceland and the name Petra, um, I think they will mm -hmm. find this beautiful little museum that she created in the north of Iceland with all the beautiful stones she found basically all by herself. So her name was very mm -hmm. meaningful to her. Uh, as is your grandmother's name to you, because uh, now, now yeah. she's uh, both of your grandmothers are um, memorialized in your nom de plume. We shall call it. Yeah, your writing name. <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, definitely, my grandmother on my father's side was all very um, interested in in Santaria, and um, you know, I afterwards, you know, learning more about her um, has really enriched my life and, and really um, also enriched. So different characters that I include in the story, um, you know, of Puerto Rican descent and, and different and their cross-cultural experiences as well. Sure. So it really just you know, enhances. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And, um, you know, shortly after that dream is where I really got to work on writing the book. And, um, you know, I think it, it definitely helped me, um, you know, pursue it. You know, Lucina, I would love to see you write a corollary book about the factual experiences that occurred to you in this life in terms of any kind of psychic manifestations, especially where it revolved around writing your books. What do you think of that? I, I'm a step ahead of you. I am going to be featured in two weeks in Luna Luna magazine where I write about Mexican white magic and um, an experience that I had as a teenager. So <laughs> so it'll be out soon. Oh, that's that's really, really wonderful. And I'll be looking forward to that. And, and you said the name of the book, uh, the name of the publication is Luna Luna, and it's available online. Is that true? Yeah. Luna Luna magazine. And I think it'll be out in two weeks. Um, and it's titled Mexican White Magic. With, and two weeks, uh, and it's from, about two weeks from now would be the end of August 2017, because as you know, this podcast <laughs> lives for a long time on the Internet so that people yeah. know uh, where and how to look. So um, uh, can you give us a, a little glimpse into the next uh, uh, Daniela story? Uh, well, the next Daniela story is um, the main character is, um, you know, starting to continue to navigate her powers. Um, so in book one, she discovers them, but doesn't really know how to use them. And um, even though she's quite powerful, she makes a lot of mistakes. And um, she wants to go back in time and ends up in the wrong time. So that catapults the story because now, um, now she's got to also kind of get back to her work of finding um, her friend Daphne, who she lost in book one. Um, but with that hiccup, it certainly makes a mess. So that's where I'm at in book two um, of Daniela, trying to learn more about her magic, learn more about her family, her culture, her history, and um, put it all together. Uh, have, have you been down to... Um outside of Mexico City to the shrine of, of um, Our Lady of... Oh, uh, it gets, I'm sorry. Our, the shrine outside of Mexico City. <laughs> help me here, Lucina. Uh, uh, yeah, I've been to um, the uh, Basilica yes. um, in Mexico City of the Virgen de Guadalupe. I've been uh, there Virgin of Guadalupe. Times. That's who I was thinking of, yeah. yes. <laughs> so you, yes, I've been there many times. Many times. So you're yeah. familiar with the pilgrims who come on their hands and knees for for 120 yes, miles, etc., dressed in white, yeah. etc. It was quite yes, an experience yes. for me when I was there. I was very impressed by the devotion of those individuals yes. that came there. Yes, my mother actually escorted her partner, um, you know, when I was a child to the Basilica on her knees. Um, in devotion and in thanks for being healed. Um, so I do remember that, you know, um, helping her to, um, you know, go on her knees to reach the Basilica. So that, yeah, so it was a, an impactful experience for me hmm. growing um, up. Now, um, what are your feelings about the identity of the Virgin of Guadalupe? Um, 
I know the Catholic Church venerates her as uh, an mm-hmm. apparition for, from uh, the, the, the mother of Jesus, Mary, St. Mary, the mother of Jesus, mm-hmm. the Madonna, if you will. But um, yeah. the folkloric feeling, and this extends into a sort of New Age culture in the United States, seems to feel like the Virgin of Guadalupe uh, it was the corn goddess of uh, pre-Columbian times. Uh, have, do you have right. any feelings uh, about that? Um, you know, in my research now of um, different Aztecs and Mayan um, beliefs and um, gods um, that they had, you know, it's it's so interesting because you can see the similarities and, and how, you know, when the conquistadors came, um, you know, so many of their manuals, the Popol Vuh that was burned, and so we're missing so much of um, the history um, but but I think that they're interrelated. I think that they are very, very closely connected. And um, it, it's fascinating when, when you read about, um, you know, the Mayan culture, the Aztec culture, their gods and deities. It's um, interesting, for sure. <laughs> a- absolutely. Absolutely. I, I had read about some of the pre-Catholic um, uh, sightings of apparitions in that area of a woman dressed in blue with long golden hair like corn silk. That's what I'm re- sort mm-hmm. of referring to. But uh, we want to uh, we want to thank you so very much for being on Shattered Reality Podcast. Um, yeah, it's great uh, because really, thank you so much. Yeah, and, and really, congratulations on being so successful. I, I don't know how old you are, but you certainly sound very young. And uh, for your first <laughs> book, you did very very well. And. You, you great future ahead. Thank don't you. you think? We are absolutely thrilled mm-hmm. that you were inspired by Shattered Reality Podcast. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yes, yeah, so, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> why don't you, Lucina, before you go, mention the name of the book, the publisher, where they can get it, uh, your award, and so forth. Just just go through the whole thing and the Luna the Luna description, Luna Luna description as well, oh, so yeah. people can yeah, follow yeah. up. Okay, yes. Um, so the book is titled Santa Muerte, the Daniela story, and it's available on Amazon. Um, I will be doing a Goodreads giveaway uh, in October for the Day of the Dead and Halloween. So oh. if you sign up, you can get a free autographed copy. Um, and also I'll be um, featured in Luna Luna magazine um, with a small uh, article referencing uh, Mexican white magic and my experience as uh, a teenager. So hopefully, readers, if um, you know you enjoy the book, you'll check that out as well. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. We're going to say goodbye to you right now, um, but we hope Thank to have you, you on again, Lucina, when your next book comes out. Mm-hmm. All righty? Yes, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you, Farusha, for having me on. It's just been such a, a privilege to be on with you guys today. Thank oh, it's you. our pleasure entirely. Truly. Our pleasure truly. entirely. And best of luck. Not that I think you're going to need it, though. I think this is truly a creative artist. And we, gee, maybe we actually were right there at the beginning of a fabulous career. Yeah, we think that you will enjoy this slightly shorter show mm-hmm. of Shattered, Shattered Reality. reality. Uh, not too, too much. What was that?